So here we are trying to video this, which is uh, going to be a challenge for me, but I don't think that will matter a whole lot to you, I hope. The, my big thing is to be on the screen. Yeah. So to be on the screen, I have to kind of stay here. And if I come too far forward, then you look like at my stomach, which is, I don't think, what anybody here wants to look at. So uh, it's not my normal uh, mode of operation to be pinned to this little tiny rectangle here. So that will be my challenge. But we'll just try to, I'll try to make that go as best I can. I also have to stay pretty close to the, the microphone, which is in there, because if I get too far away or if I turn away from it, it gets really muffled, not that I'm not already muffled speaking through a mask as well. So, but those are my issues, not really yours. Part of what I want you to do is to give me feedback this week. So we're going to video these, and I'm going to post them as soon as I can. So because this is not streaming live, that means I'm going to video this lesson. As soon as this class is over, I'm going to try to upload the video onto Canvas. But it takes a while to upload, like probably 30 minutes or something like that. So tomorrow, when you're working remotely, you can either wait until you know 30 minutes from the end of this class and then try to see if you can access it and then go from there. Or you know you, you can maybe see what you want to do. Because the, I do have those other instructional videos posted that are just more of that Khan Academy style video. So if you want, you know, if, if mornings are your, you know, better work time or however you schedule your day, the only thing is that what you will miss or you might want to check out here is that, you know, the beginning of class typically is going to be where, you know, like we did last year, I may, you know, put a couple of um, practice problems up on the board and, and then I'll be checking your notes and homework. Or if I have a little quiz, I won't start the video. Uh, so you won't see that because I'll have to give the quiz on different days. So it'll just be a shorter video that day. But then I'll answer questions from the homework, and, and that might be of value. So, you know, if you had a question on the homework, it might be worth at least uh, tuning in to the beginning of the, the posted video there so you can see that part of the discussion, and that might help, you know, answer some of your questions. So I didn't do that on these, but what I, as I was thinking of it, you know, I, this is my first time doing it this kind of blended way, too. What, what I think I'm going to try to do, too, is uh, the videos that I post in, you know, the Khan Academy style videos will pretty much be similar to here. But what I think I'll try to do is use different examples so that, you know, if there is some particular topic that is tough for you and you get stuck on a homework problem, you can look at the recorded classroom video to see those examples and that explanation. But you can also reference, if you need to, that support video and go to that, that Khan Academy style video, and maybe see a different example worked out there. And so maybe having you know, a couple different examples for each uh, potentially really challenging problem might be more useful. I don't know. I'm just trying to make this work the best that we can. So you're going to have to tell me after this week, you know, I'll check in with you again next week, and you can be kind of my litmus test, you know, are these recorded instructional videos valuable? Are, do you find yourself just watching this, or do you find yourself just watching the Khan Academy style video, or are having both of them available, is that uh, a better resource? So, you know, if, um, you know, if nobody's going to watch the live one, then I'm not going to waste my time and trouble doing it. You know, if you're just going to go to the Khan uh, Academy kind of video, if only a couple of people are using those, I may still do it because I can see value for that down the road, maybe more so than the, the actual recorded classroom. But, but we'll see. So I'll, I'll be asking you for feedback down the road. Okay? So we clear where we're supposed to be so far. You should have. Uh, submitted through Canvas the, the picture of the student goal sheet. You should have joined uh, BC Calculus. Um, we'll do the video today. I'm going to do just a quick kind of refresher of some of the rules because some of them are slightly different than what we've done in the past. And then uh, 
I may talk a little bit about the topic outline there, and then we can dive into actually doing some math. So let me see, uh, always a challenge if I can uh, use my um, newly developing uh, skills and find, uh, let's AP prep, where the BC Calc rules go is the question. Dang it. Mm -hmm. How do I pull that up? Dang it. Oh, maybe this isn't going to work because I can't find it. That's not what I want. Well, I think that's going to be close enough. No, not AP prep. Not AP calculus. No, that's not AP calculus. Oh, goodness. Not AP calculus. Who knows? I have five copies of AP prep. Ah! Well, this is going to look pretty much the same. The big thing I wanted to do is show you this topic questions. So this is where your this is where the change is for you. You know, the, the grading scale is still the same. That's the math scale. A, B, C, we don't do Ds. Uh, not that anybody's shooting for a D in here, I hope. Uh, but uh, in the past, last year, we did uh, the note cards. And so I... AP has made all of these resources, all kinds of, they're really going over the top to create resources to help teachers and students now that people are struggling to go online or blended or whatever. So I want to incorporate some of that stuff, but I already have you doing so much stuff already. I don't feel like I can keep throwing more stuff on top. And so I'm trying to, if I put something in, take something out to keep the, the net effect close to the same, and I don't know if I've done that or not. So I'm throwing out the note cards. Not that I, yeah, I know that's going to really make some of you sad. <laughs> Try to contain yourself over there. So instead, what I put in there is this topic questions. So what AP is trying to do is they have a map of what their sequence is for the class, which may or may not be the same as any particular class in the country. But uh, it, it, then for each of those topics, they are going to uh, put what they call topic questions, which is like three multiple choice questions from earlier AP exams. So it's a way to incorporate actual AP style test questions throughout the year, not waiting just till, till May or April to start your review. Now, since we are going to go on this walk, we're not going to do calculus until probably second quarter. So that's not even going to come up in the first quarter. But when it does in the second quarter, what I'm going to try to do is I'll post it on Canvas. You'll see, you know, for Monday, we're going to do, say, limits. And, you know, you'll have to either see in, in person the lecture or watch the video. You'll have a homework assignment, and you will have some topic questions assigned. You'll have to be joined into this BC classroom, which certainly by second quarter we will be. And then you will log on to there. And I don't know if I can put the link on or not. I'll, that's a technology issue for me. But hopefully you'll be able to just click through Canvas onto there. And it'll give you like three mobile choice questions. And so you'll say, you know, it's C, D, A, whatever. And it'll grade it right away and tell you, oh, way to go, it was right. Or, Nope, it was wrong. It should have been this. Now, I, I'm not going to grade you based on the correctness of your answer. I just want you to do it. And so you, your grade there will just be that you have done those topic questions. But once we get into the flow, it'll be pretty much each day. And, and then what's kind of neat for me, I mean for you too, I think, it will do it cumulatively. So as we go through the year and we get into February and March, you're going to have this whole kind of database about how well you did throughout the year. And you might say, man, back when we were doing limits and derivatives, I really remembered that well, and we're going to review it in the second quarter. And I rocked those. You know, I did pretty well. Uh, some of this stuff there, man, when we started talking about 
uh, the mean value term, I guess I didn't remember that very well. Or when we did, you know, U substitution, those integrals, or the trig integrals, I didn't do that very well. And so you'll have that feedback in real time and also knowing that, oh, I better talk about that more. For me, I can see everybody as a class. And I can say, oh, I think our class pretty much understands, you know, the, the, av the average value of a function. You know, you guys did pretty well on that, but, ooh, boy, I don't know, not so well on that uh, integration by parts. I think I'd better come back and spend another day on that. So it, I think it has the potential to give each of us some really meaningful feedback. So I don't know. It's going to experiment, but we're going to try it. That's what that's about. It's going to be 5% to your grade, and it's not based, I mean, don't freak out if, like, you know, it's, it's an AP question. So, you know, uh, 108.10, you guys didn't take the real AP test last year. You got the, the abbreviated version. But the real AP test is 108 points, and that's what we're aiming for this year. Half of it is going to be multiple choice. You know, and on the 108 points, typically 65 to 70 is a 5. So, you know, if you're scoring 70 out of 108 and you rocked the test, those are hard questions, right? You know, so so it wouldn't be fair to try to grade those and say, you know, you got 90% to get an A. Shoot, if you get 90% on the AP exam, you're a rock star. You know, so uh, I just want you to do them, and uh, and then we can each get that feedback from you. Okay, that's the big difference, I think, from there. Questions on that? Everything else I think is the same. Oh, I, I mean, it, everything's different this year, but even though it's the same. So, uh, so the way I'm going to try to grade homework is when you're here in person like before. So today you're going to get homework number two. Tomorrow you're going to get homework number three. When I see you on Wednesday and you come to class, I'll probably have um, some kind of practice problem or something on the board. And then I'm going to say, can I see homework two and homework three? And so you're going to hold up your notebook and, you know, there's homework two, there's homework three, or there's homework two, that might be more right. And I'm just kidding, sort of. And there's homework three. And so, and again, uh, what I'm looking for is have you attempted 90% of the problems? Show me the work. I'm going to try to give you odd problems as much as I can. I'm not trying to see if you can copy the answers accurately out of the back. I want to see the work that leads to the answer. Okay, as before, I'm going to check your notebook. So you're going to take notes. I want you to take notes here in class like before. Anything I put on the board, I expect you to write down. When you're at home, whether you're watching the in-class video or even if you're doing the Khan Academy instructional video at the end, you need to take notes on those. So when you take the test, and the first test is going to be Friday, September 18th in the morning, I will have to come with you. I'm not sure where we're going to do it yet. Mr. Lewis is looking into that for me. You'll give me your notebook like we did last year, and I'll check the notes for all of Chapter 1. So you got to take them every day. got to keep it organized and keep track of it and bring it to me on test day. And so uh, and it's going to be it just works out this time. Everybody's taking a test. All my students are going to be taking a test on Friday, September 18th. So it'll probably be either like in the cafeteria, which I think would be better, or maybe in the theater, somewhere where we can socially distance. And, uh, you know, you'll have an hour and a half. On the early test, you may not need the full hour and a half. So, you know, you'll come in, give me your notebook, go find your space, get your test, you'll work it. Whenever you're done, you can bring it to me, and then you're good to go. Get your notebook back, and you can go. Not doing note cards this year, just the notebook. That make sense? It's weird. It's weird. I agree. Okay. All right. Anything about the general overall thing, the blended thing? Okay. So I'm going to switch back to the camera, I think, I hope. Uh, let's see. Can we just do this? I want to go back to that. Oh. It's still running. That's good news. Oh, I'm on there. I think it's working. All right, here we go. We're actually going to do some math here. So we are going to talk about uh, 
color coordinates. And in our book, this is section 11.1. So, can I forget, did you guys in your AP prep days, did we do polders in here? Does that sound familiar? Some say yes, some say no. So I, I tried to do a section on polars in AP prep, but some years, uh, because of time constraints, like this year, that got edited out. But I think you guys saw it. You may not remember it, but it'll come back. It'll come back. So the idea is that uh, we use still our x, y axis. So I'm still considering that an x, y axis laying kind of there on the board. But we can think of, you know, you have a point, uh, say, right here, that has any particular x and y coordinates. And so in, in rectangular coordinates, so these are known as rectangular when it's x and y. They're known as polars coordinates when it's r and theta. So uh, I'm going to do this. There's going to be an r and a theta. So the r comes first, and the theta comes second. Now, in rectangular coordinates, this is a, a unique representation. So, you, you know, you go over whatever x is, and you go up whatever y is, and that puts you at that spot. And those coordinates, are, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence there. So this, whatever that x and y are, name that point, and that point lies where those x and y's take it. And that's it. They're unique. R and theta, uh, it gets a little more blurred. So the idea is with R and theta that the R, so you kind of think of this, if you want, you can think of it as a vector, or you can just think of it as a, a line segment joining there. It doesn't really matter. And we'll see as we do this, the lines between polar and vector and parametric kind of get blurred sometimes. And so the idea is you can kind of flow between them, and you may think of it one time as being coordinates, and another time as being a vector, and another time, maybe you'd be in a parametric point. We'll talk more about those, too. And it's just a matter of what, in your world, in your mind, helps it make better sense. So sometimes there may be a right or wrong way, but most of the time, it, it's whatever makes it make better sense to you. So the R is this distance from the, now, this point where we have 0, 0. In rectangular, that's known as the origin. But in polar coordinates, that's referred to as the pole. But they're synonyms. They mean the same thing. So that starting place there is the pole or, uh, or the origin. Now, in rectangular, you would consider this to be the positive x-axis. In, uh, in the language of polars, this is known as the polar axis. But again, they're interchangeable. So uh, it's kind of a, and we'll see this when we get some graphs going. It'll become more clear. Uh, it, it almost reads like, you know, if you ever watch the weather on the news or the weather channel or anything, it's kind of like Doppler radar, you know, where, you know, you have this little thing here, and then if you're ever watching when they're looking for clouds or storms, it kind of spins around there counterclockwise, and then you see those. That's how you go in polar. So you start on the polar axis or the positive x-axis and positive means you're going counterclockwise and you can go negative as clockwise but you sweep around there and then the R is how far away from that pole from the origin are you. And so that's what we mean. So the theta then is going to be this angle right here. So that's the R and the theta. So if we try to graph, say, uh, and, and we can use theta as either uh, in, sometimes we'll do it in uh, degrees, and sometimes we'll do it in radians. That's not a big issue. And if you do it in one and somebody else does it in the other, uh, we can figure it out. That's not our issue in this class. So what that means is, you know, the way you think of it is you say, okay, here's the angle of starting with zero. We're going to go counterclockwise, pi over 3. And so we know that's going to take us somewhere up here. So here's our angle, pi over 3. And then, like you do when you're on an x-y axis, you decide 
what the unit is. What is one? So I'm going to say, well, that's one, that's two, and so right there is the point two pi over three. So it's on the angle pi over three, a distance of two from the pole. Does that make sense? Okay, so everything's fine and good until we start messing around with the negatives and then all of a sudden it's not so clear anymore. So let's do the point uh, negative uh, 3 and 3 pi over 4. Okay, so just when you think you get the hang of it, 3 pi over 4, let's see, we're going to start, you know, there is 0. We're sweeping counterclockwise, and so we're coming along there, and here's our angle, 3 pi over 4, right here in quadrant 2. There's theta equals 3 pi over 4. Okay, now all we got to do is go a negative 2 on this angle. Well, positive means you come out from the pole. Negative means you, on that same angle, shoot back through the pole. So you're going to come down here into quadrant 4. A length of whatever you decide 3 is. And that is going to be our point P. That is that negative 3 comma 3 pi over 4. That's when it starts to get really kind of weird and takes some getting used to. So what that means then is that whole idea of uniqueness of an ordered pair that we had in rectangular totally goes out the window in polar. So if we do something like say negative 1 uh, comma negative 30 degrees, so I'm switching to degrees and I'm giving a negative angle. Oh, so many, so many variables that can change in this. So my negative 30 degrees is going to come down here because positive goes counterclockwise and negative goes clockwise. We're going to go out a length of negative 1. Well, that means I'm going to go back through the pole. So that's going to come out this way. And so I'm going to go that length of 1 in the negative direction. So that is that point P. Okay? Need nods or heads. We're okay with that. Okay. So, now, that kind of weird as it is, but we can also say, well, we can get to that same point by going, so this is now totally equivalent. If we say we go, now this would be a positive 1, and this angle would be 150 degrees. So, 1, 150 degrees, is exactly the same point as negative 1, negative 30 degrees. Well, we don't have to stop there, right? You've seen this before. We could come around this way. So we could go through this yellow angle, which is a negative angle, and come out still a positive 1. So still we have equality. Positive 1 is the angle. I'm sorry, positive 1 is the R value. And now the angle is going to be negative 210, right? So negative 210 degrees. Oh, we're not finished with this, right? Because we could have, instead of when we did the negative 30 degrees to get down here in quadrant 4, what have I not used, we could come around this way at a positive angle. And so that would be then... 330 degrees positive and uh, negative 1 R value. Now you could do this all day because you could still add multiples of 360 or negative 360 to each of these and continue to generate an infinite number of points. I will ask you sometimes to find the four coordinates where the, the angle goes from negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi or negative 360 to positive 360. So you're always going to get four if you're just going to restrict yourself to one trip around the circle in either direction. Does that make sense? Kind of crazy, but kind of fun. Okay, so we want to be able to do coordinate conversion. So we're going to do coordinate conversion, which is the easy kind of conversion. Oh, Mr. Yeah. This camera looks like it's... Oh, I think it's still going. I think it's just not going up to mine, but thank you. Thank you. I hope anyway. So 
So this is the easier of the two conversion. We're going to do equation conversion on a little bit, and that's going to be way, way harder. What time do I have in here to go? 20 minutes. So 2.30? Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to go back to our x, y axis here. And if we consider this point again in rectangulars and also it's going to be R and theta. So we know that this is the R, this is the theta. I'm going to draw in our reference triangle like we have done so fondly so many times. And then we have, there's the X and Y. So the conversion is going to be, you know, just like what we did in our uh, trig days way back in AP prep. And so we can say that uh, if we want to find out what, suppose we know what R and theta are, and we want to convert to X and Y. So if we know the R and the theta, then you can see from here that the cosine of theta, the cosine of theta is from our Sokotoa trig, is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. It's going to be X over R. And so multiplying the r to the other side, we are going to get that x is going to be r cosine theta. So you can recreate that if you need to. But we will do it so much, at least in this chapter, that hopefully you just kind of remember it. x is going to be r cosine theta. In a similar fashion, sine theta is going to be the opposite y over the hypotenuse r. And so solving for y, is going to give us our sine theta. And so there is our conversion. So when we are given the r and the theta, and we the polar coordinates, and we want to convert it to rectangular, this is how we're going to do it. Make sense? I go the other way, a little messier, but not too bad. Uh, so we just want to start this time with the x and y. So if we know the rectangular coordinates, and we want to go to the polar coordinates. So then what we see is that this r, compared to the x and y that we have in orange here, if we knew the x and the y, how do we find the r? It's just Pythagorean, right? Pythagorean. So you know that the r is going to be the square root of x squared plus y squared. Am I OK jumping to that from Pythagorean theorem? Okay, now if you know the x and the y, how do you find the theta? Yeah, so you can see from here that tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. So theta is going to be the inverse tangent of y over x. But you've got to be a little careful here. Because sometimes you're going to just know what this is because it's a known value. Other times you may have to use your calculator to get it. But your calculator, remember, is going to give you the principal value of inverse tangent, which means it's always going to give you either a quadrant one angle if you're taking inverse tangent of a positive, or you're going to get that quadrant four angle as a negative if you're taking the inverse tangent of a negative. But you've got to look at where those original xy coordinates were and make sure you're in the correct quadrant. So you may have to doctor up that theta so that your answer in polar coordinates is consistent with the quadrant that you have here. Let's do an example. Okay, so let's see if we have... So I'm going to give you the point is P, and we're going to say, uh, so 4 comma 5 pi over 6. And can you convert that to rectangulars? What do you think? How bold are we? Anybody willing to come to the board on this one or no? Of course, no calculator. Of course, somebody would have to come up here and actually be up on screen for all of posterity. That would be terrifying. Keegan's up. Keegan's up for that. You can only volunteer yourself. What do you think? Pass or you in? No? no? 
Well, you like this one? Yeah. <laughs> also, two others. Also, it's on camera. You got to have to <laughs> Okay, how do we do this? I don't know. Help me out. X is going to be right. I'm going to write it out here on cosine theta, so it's going to be 4 times the cosine of 5 pi over 6. Wait, and if you're right here, you'd be getting credit for it right there on, on film. <laughs> you okay with letting that go? So cosine 4 5 pi over 6, what's that going to be? And we're in quadrant 2, right? So reference angle is pi over 6. Remember, cosine starts big. 1 square to 3 over 2. 5 pi over 6 puts us in quadrant 2. Cosine there is negative. So it's going to be a negative square to 3 over 2. You okay with that? Yeah, now we are. Sure. Okay, so we can cancel all the 2, so it's going to be a negative 2 square to 3. So that, we have found, is our x coordinate. The hang of it? Yeah. So the y coordinate would be our sine theta. So again, the r is going to be 4. Now we need the sine of 5 pi over 6. I'm trying to stall for you to give you a chance to think about that. 1 half, quadrant 2, sine is still positive, so we're good to go. So that's going to make it be just 2. There you have it. Holders to rectangulars. Okay. Let's go to the other one. I'm going to go from rectangular to polars, but I'm going to ask you to get four versions of this. So let's go from, well, what can we do that we can actually do? How about, let's say, a negative 2, comma, uh, I think I can do 2 square 3. Let me think of it there. Yeah, I think that'll work. Okay, and we're going to go to from rectangular to polar. No calculator here. We can do this. I have great confidence in you. Now we've been through it once. Probably somebody's ready to come to the board and try this. Uh, never mind. Okay. Help me, somebody. I want to do it with you. R equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. Ah, excellent. Okay, so you can go ahead and do this on your own. I'm just going to talk out loud while I do it. So we got negative 2 squared plus 2 squared, 3 squared. I can do the negative 2 squared is 4. Let's see, 2 squared is 3 times 2, 2 squared is 3 is going to be 4 times 3 to be 12. Oh, this is a carefully constructed problem. Looks like VR is 4. Good to go? Can't. You don't have to say that just to make me feel better. <laughs> I, I know we've got some rust to get off there. Okay, now we got this issue of theta. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. Suppose we're trying to find theta. Or tangent of 2 square root of 3 over negative 2. Okay, so we're doing the y over the x. Okay, and I think we can cancel the twos. Oh, I left the negative off there. So that's going to be a negative square root of three. I'm going to ignore the negative for a minute. This is actually a known value. Okay, let's see, I'm trying to help Kent with his rust. So this is a known value, square root of three. So I don't know how you do this. You can do a you can do a triangle and draw it, or you can think of it as if these are known values, then it's going to have to come from square root of 3 over a half. You with me there? So the same angle that makes tangent square root of 3 makes sine square root of 3 over 2 and makes cosine 1 half. And that angle is pi over 3. So now that is our reference angle. We are not going to be fooled because we recognize the original that had a negative x value and a positive y value that must come from quadrant 2. So our reference angle of pi over 3 
is going to actually give us an angle in quadrant 2 that would be 5 over 3. Huh. Is that fun or what? Don't answer that. So one version of this is 4 comma 2 pi over 3. Remember, that's giving us this angle that's going to be over here in quadrant 2. Now, we're going to find four different versions of that, all that have the theta between a negative 2 pi and a positive 2 pi. All right? So should we... The next one, let's keep the R positive, just so we can do this together. What is the negative angle that's going to take us to that very same place? Four pi over, negative 4 pi over 3. Negative 4 pi over 3. Very good. Okay. Now, we can also do this with an R value that is negative, actually two of them. So if we do an R value that is negative... That's going to put us down here in quadrant 4, and the negative r is going to shoot us back into quadrant 2. So this positive angle that's going to take us down here to quadrant 4 is going to be 5 pi over 3 indeed. And the negative angle that will take us into quadrant 4 where the negative R value will shoot us back into quadrant 2 is going to be... Good. Make sense? Okay. So let's do equation conversion, which is way harder. I think the hard part... I mean, we're still doing the same conversion. You know, the X is R cosine theta, Y is R sine theta, and so on. But um, it, it's just a bit of an art to this. So it, it can look a little bit different. So uh, we are going to say, start with R equals 4 cosine theta. And we want to convert that to what we would say is rectangular. So we want uh, to trade in the R's and the thetas for X's and Y's. But probably it's not the most efficient way to just trade in the r for square root of x squared plus y squared and the theta for inverse uh, tangent of y over x. Instead, it's kind of an art to it. It's hard to have. <laughs> the hard thing is it takes experience to get good at this, but you, there's no great way to get the experience except by fumbling around and making mistakes and stuff like that. So anybody have a brilliant idea on what to do here? Remember, our cosine theta we know is x. So we could create an r cosine theta by multiplying both sides by r. So that's going to make this e and r squared, which is actually a good thing because r is the square root of x squared plus y squared. Right? We know that conversion. So that means r squared is going to be, I'll get rid of the radical, even better. You with me? So that's going to be x squared plus y squared. And this r cosine theta we know is x. Now at this point in time, you could stop. I mean, if you really wanted to uh, warm the heart of your math teacher, and, uh, he doesn't want to do that, I'll answer that. You know, you could do this. This is purely optional. You could then complete the square of x. Of course, who's forgotten how to do that? I'll answer that. Adding 4 to both sides. Okay. Noting that this is the quantity x minus 2 squared plus y squared plus 4, where you go, oh, this is actually, what is this? A circle with radius 2 and center 2, 0. Wow, that was fun. 
right, okay. Suppose we have something like r is equal to 6 cosecant theta. And now we want to convert that from r's and thetas. Well, we did this one. Well, we did the polar on it. Well, we'll do this one. We'll have to put it out there. Got to go on the other direction. Okay. Any ideas? You could divide by cosecant theta. Okay, and then where are you going to go with that? Well, then, isn't cosecant theta 1 over sine theta? Okay, I'm going to go there right now. I think you're going the right same place that we're going to. So let's think of this as 1 over sine theta, which it is, the cosecant. Okay. Now, I think the same idea, you're going to divide by cosecant. I would say let's just multiply the sine theta to the other side. With me? That is not the overwhelming response I was hoping for. So that's going to be an r sine theta on the left. On the other side, we'll just get 6. Well, r sine theta is 1. Oh, you're right. And so that is really just a horizontal line, y equals 6. Crazy, huh? Indeed. Well, that's why I'm going to go the other way. I have a good one. Oh, that's too much. Let's do um, let's do x squared plus y squared minus six x plus two y equals zero. I'm going to run out of time here, so this is where I was hoping that these instructional videos would come in handy. So what you can do is, I'm going to finish this problem, I think I can get that done. But then I still want to talk about graphing polars. So there should be a video on the support materials part that will show you how to graph like um, rose curves, lemna skates, and lemosomes. So give that a look. Okay, here we go. Got to go to R's and thetas. How are we going to do that? Should we just blast them all out? We're going to do this. We'll see there's a more efficient way in a moment. Hopefully. So I'm going to plug in, I'm going to replace the X's by uh, R cosine theta and the Y's by R sine theta. You okay to there? Good. Somebody heard me. I'm going to square that out. R squared cosine squared theta plus R squared sine squared theta minus 6R cosine theta plus 2R sine theta equals 0. Okay? Now, squinting just at the first two problems, first two terms, rather, first two terms, I can see they've got a common factor of r squared. I'm going to factor that out just for those two terms. And do you recognize what is left behind? Oh, it's our favorite trig identity of all time. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So now we have r squared. And I'm going to move that other stuff to the other side. So I'm going to add the 6r cosine theta minus to our sine theta. You okay with there? Should we just divide through by r? And that gets us to r equals 6 cosine theta minus 2 sine theta. We have, I know that looks weird, but we're done. We got r as a function of theta. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Oh, this is where I thought those videos might come in handy. I can never finish a lesson in a class period. I can with a clear conscience. 